starts in three, two. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Bamboo Project Podcast. My name is Donovan Gray, the future $10 billion man. On the way to 10 billion, I decided I'm gonna help create 1,000 millionaires, including myself. And not by being a guru or selling the course, but by doing the things I already love to do every day and documenting my journey to get there. I figure I'll make all the mistakes so you don't have to. My name is Donovan Gray, and this is how I will turn my life into a living. I like to start off by giving a shout out to all the people rocking with us and supporting the channel. We really appreciate you. We are currently streaming on all major streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Anchor. You name it, we on it. And if we not on it, we about to be on it. For everyone listening to this podcast and not watching it, you can find us on YouTube at The Bamboo Project. We have over 500 videos on our channel. Do you want to see our real estate journey? We got that. Do you want cooking tutorials inspired by Dr. Sabi? We got that. Do you want travel and lifestyle vlogs? Got it. Hair and makeup tutorials? Got it. Basketball? Got it. Turo? Got it. Candles? Got it. It's everything us. All the parts of the journey that do not make it to YouTube will be on our story. You can find me on Instagram at Donovan Gray, D-O-N-I-V-A-N-G-R-A-Y, and my phenomenal, beautiful, amazing girlfriend, Anita Byrne, A-N-E-T-A-B-U-R-N. We made different playlists for all the things we're into, and you can find all those links in the description box below. This may be your first time here, and if it is, welcome to the family, but for everyone else, this is chapter three, page 156, okay? So right now it is Wednesday, March 15th, and it is 7.20 a.m. Probably one of the earlier podcasts that we've shot in before. So before we get into the podcast, we always like to start off with our screen time check. It's a reminder for us and anybody listening to see how much time they are spending and giving to their phone. All right. So last week, every day, I spent an average of seven hours and 39 minutes on my phone, which Again, like I said, for me, between seven and eight is my sweet spot. I feel like anything more is excessive. We're a little on the high end of that time, but it's not terrible. I spent eight hours on Twitter for the whole week, which again, that's pretty good. It's about an hour a day, which is more than I used to. And my Instagram is down to six hours. That's less than an hour a day on Instagram. That's really good. That's that's really good. Twitter, listen, I enjoy Twitter much more than Instagram. And I honestly, it's kind of crazy. I only go on Instagram now, really just for like business type of stuff. That is like the candle page. I don't really go on there for much other stuff. Hmm. So YouTube is seven hours and 43 minutes. Camera is six hours and 49 minutes. And as I said, Instagram is six hours and 10 minutes, which is close to five hours. Close to that five hour mark. Last week, I had an average of 157 pickups per day. On Sunday, I had 222 pickups. Two, two, two. And my first use app after pickup was mail. What was your screen time for last week? Last week, um, my average screen time was five hours and a half a day. And my most used app was Instagram for seven and a half hours, then TikTok for six and a half, then camera for four and a half. And then I picked up my phone on average 139 times a day. The subscriber check. So on the Bamboo Project, we currently have 6,416 subscribers. And on the Ember Candle Co. YouTube channel, which is where we do our weekly vlogs, we have 221 total subscribers. So shout out to all of y'all who are subscribed to the YouTube Candle page. Oh, and we actually just hit 500,000 views on our main channel. So that's cool. Shout out to the Bimble Project and all of y'all. This wasn't going to be what I talk about first, but now that I said that, made me think about it. We hired an editor for short form content. So right now, I believe he lives in the UK somewhere, and he is currently making shorts. So he had made five over the weekend. And I put them in the Discord to see what everybody feels about them. And we kind of all have the very similar sentiment where they seem like they could be just kind of just generated. 
reels to some degree. A lot of our content is not purposely geared to, but it's around the things that older people tend to like and more mature people, I would say for sure. I think a lot of people that watch the channel are doing something with their life. They're trying to do something with their life. They're mature. They kind of have a somewhat of a life already, right? They're not really like young. Like our demographic is like 25 to 50 plus like, and it's the ones that are who are on the younger side of it are hustling really hard. So the shorts that were made had a lot of elements to it that a younger audience would like. So a lot of random sound effects, a lot of like flashing on the screen of random icons and, you know, silly faces and things like that. So personally, I'm not a fan because I don't think it embodies what the Bamboo Project is or kind of what we do. So I want it to be more, I, I, I don't mind it. It's just not done correctly for what we do so the captions are fine i'm gonna i'll put them up here actually so people who are watching the videos i will put those on the screen and you can like watch them the areas where we could have definitely made more money or at least lost less money would have been traveling every trip we take to drop the car off cost us probably close to hundred dollars then on top of us adding little treats to the car that costs about like six seven dollars so we're at 107 dollars before we even make a profit what i haven't been doing is i have not been charging people for gas and things like that when they don't fill the car up so that costs us some more dollars on top so honestly at that point we're probably looking at every trip cost us probably about a hundred to a hundred and twenty dollars to drop just just to, just to drop the car off yeah. so if we don't make at least a hundred and twenty dollars we're losing money on the car and that doesn't include washing it i forgot washing it and we wash it for every trip so that's about another thirty dollars so we're talking about a about hundred and forty dollars for every single trip that we take for the car so do you know how much money we've made on turo so far uh i could guess okay what, what's your guess probably like i'm gonna say two thousand. Oh wow really okay so as you can see here we have made with the car so far two thousand one hundred and forty four dollars actually is missing uh the today's oh, yeah. booking okay so then this trip will bring us 280 so that will bring us up to 2424 dollars very interesting number it's actually a lot that's more than i thought not enough but it's a good amount not enough how's it not enough you we're gonna go through it oh lord i'm scared yes that's how much we made and depending on who you are maybe that's a lot maybe it's not a lot but there's always going to be expenses that come into play when running a business detailing the car is in my opinion a very frivolous expense it seems like all that means is they clean the inside of your car most car washes just do the outside they might wipe down the dashboard and so on and so forth out of all the details i went to they all did a terrible job they left stuff in the car there was a mess left in the car it's usually a hundred plus sometimes two hundred dollars even the day of our first trip was a disaster because i'm like okay you know what let's try and get the car detailed before the trip let's go there really early Early. the guy ended up taking too long to get the car detailed we got there late the license plate the car was new so because the car was new we had not got a license plate holder yet so we were driving around with no license plate which is why you can see on here we have it might not be on this actual month we have several tickets for improperly displayed license plate so the car got booked on the 17th honestly we listed the car on the 16th we weren't expecting the car to get booked that quickly and it got booked for like three weeks we were like wow this is crazy so we're going to like dollar tree getting snacks uh we're gonna go get a lock box for the car so we're in the dollar tree parking lot we're like you know what let's go to home depot and get the lock box we come back from home depot and the car is gone would you believe me if i told you that our car just got towed you wouldn't believe me right you probably wouldn't believe me but that's crazy that's the spot where we was at they said you are not allowed to leave the parking lot if you have your car parked here so before we even made any money on the car we lost $160 getting the car towed. How would we be able to get a car? We don't have any income to show that we can afford a car. So we have to figure out how to finesse getting a car with no income and no actual money really in our account. 
So we decided to go with Carvana. Uh, very useful in the situation. They sell used cars, but a Honda CRV. Cars we delivered in about two or three weeks. The last day or last week, we're not getting no response from them about where the car is, what's going on. Okay. A day or two before we were supposed to get the car, they let us know that they have crashed the car. Our first time ever buying a car, Carvana crashes it, or so they say, and now we don't have a car. And we're thinking like, damn, maybe this is a sign we shouldn't do Turo because, you know, it's not gonna work. We went with it anyways. We said, you know what, we're gonna try to get a different car and see. We found a car we wanted to get. We ended up getting a Chevrolet Equinox. That's what I saw was the best car for us to get. So now we're going through all the processes of getting the car ready for Turo. Um, these are the first initial edits, and then we'll go back and try and fix them. Because he lives in the UK, we're trying to figure out the best time to actually get on the phone again. And I think it's really funny because when we first started getting into entrepreneurship, uh, well, me and Melissa probably a couple years ago, I always try to be very present in what we're actually going through. So at the time, if someone asked me to do something or they wanted to get in the meeting or something like that, I would always kind of be like, yeah, we just have, uh, like we have free time. Like we don't have nothing else to do. And that's because at that point, the business was so small and we were still trying to figure out what we want to do that we couldn't really, that we didn't have, I, I didn't want to fake it and be like, oh, no, 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 I'm too busy to get on a meeting with you or get on a phone call with you. I can't do it. I'll be like, nah, listen, I don't have a job. I don't work like a regular, typical nine to five job. So I'm good. I have free time all the time. Um, but I think it's funny now because that's kind of flipped and I really don't have the time to do a lot of phone calls. So we were trying to schedule a call, but as y'all know, we have Chelsea this week. So we're working all day from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. And that means we have to travel to and from. So going back home, we get home at about 8.39, let's say 8.30. And then on the way to there, we're leaving the house at like 9.30, 10. So all that time right there that I could have used to get on a phone call with somebody, I no longer have that time to do. So it's like, okay, when do I schedule a time to do this phone call? Because I don't want to do all I'm at the fair selling candles. I can't do on a train because I don't have service. And I still am a human, so I need sleep. I need to relax and unwind or wind down when I get home. So we're trying to get, I th honestly, what time is it? I hope we don't have a meeting for today. I feel like he says 8 a.m. today. Maybe. No, no. I think I told him today's Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. I, I forgot the other thing. We also have the podcast. So I have to now account for the podcast time. We're shooting the podcast super early because we have the fair in three and a half hours or so, right? So today was, I couldn't do. And I also have to account for editing the podcast in the morning. So tomorrow I'm going to be editing it when I wake up. So I'm like, all right, I try to set a call for like 8 a.m. tomorrow because I normally wake up around like between... Eh, daylight saving time now, so it's probably between five and six ish in that time. So I hope I can get the podcast edited by then, and then get on the phone with him. And we also have another phone call, and it's kind of funny because she was saying, "Yeah, like sometime later in the month." And I definitely was not scheduling calls weeks in advance to be able to get on the phone with someone. So I just think it's very interesting how the progression of the business has now changed our schedule to where we have to pin something like okay we're we're free at this time but we can't do these other six or seven days and honestly we're doing double bookings this weekend and again i need my rest so when monday come next week i'm probably gonna be f mentally done so i mean physically i feel like mentally i'd be good now because you do something what you love so it's easier to have more energy for it but physically definitely gonna need to go to sleep but I'm curious how those videos will go once we all work on them and edit them because my test is if we put out short form content right now, I want to do the Turo videos. And my strategy is to put out the short form of the Turo videos because then YouTube will push our older Turo video, which is the most popular one on the channel and also has the highest 
CPM, which is how much we get paid for the video. So I'm wondering if once they push the shorts and people watch those shorts, it'll then push the other video again. So we were getting like $1,800 a month before. If we could get, you know, seven to $1,200 again, just from that video being pushed, then that would be amazing. So if that works, then I'm gonna start going down a list and see like, okay, this is how the YouTube algorithm works. Push some shorts, have the other bigger video come in, they watch that, do it again, and so on and so forth. Um, Cause we, like I said, we always need the extra money for inventory and buying candle related things. So, like I said, I'm, I'm curious how that goes. And I'm, I have been doing my shorts. If y'all were in the candle live, I've been doing, I might have missed a day or two here and there, but I definitely have been utilizing all of the different things, like a video from the podcast, excuse me, the podcast, a video from the vlog. And oddly enough, not sure how or why, but some of them are doing really well. Uh, one of them was Melissa sniffing one of the scents and rubbing her nose. And that one got a thousand views on ticked on shorts. But I do want to say when it comes to short form content, I take all the views with a grain of salt because they push things artificially, I feel like, and they force you to watch those anyway. So it, a view isn't really a view to me. So, but it is interesting to see how, like which ones they decide or people decide like just watch. So that was, uh, that's my first topic. It was mostly the shorts thing because like I said, that, that's gonna be a big driver and probably over the next mm, two months or so, uh, we'll have a lot of short form content. And he's charging $15 per short, which is not terrible, especially if he's gonna have to watch the whole video and make multiple shorts out the video. So that's a lot of content. And depending on how it goes, like I said, I, mm, would I make a second channel? Probably not because i feel like that defeats the purpose of the strategy i don't think they will show the other videos if it's on the second channel all right so topic number two yeah i know that last week we talked about the ridiculousness of how much money the house has taken from us and how we have no interest in putting more money into the house at all. So the last update y'all had was the dog doors, D-A-W-G-S, okay? The dog doors cost like $450 to $700 for the whole house. And like I said, I'm not putting any money out. Like I'm not putting no more money. Even if, even if I can scrape together the 400, or 500 I'm not doing it that is I'm, I'm sticking to the only honestly the only thing I would pay for for the house which is kind of has to be paid for is a lien that we put on the house so up until this point I never really said it on the podcast um maybe 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 early on and it like we might have caught it at like a little sliver of it when we first bought the house but since we are closing in a week from today or yesterday actually i feel comfortable to say it now so we have a lot of merchant cash advances on the house they were mca loans right and for those who are unaware of how they work you get a loan for your future income that's what they like to call it right because i think illegal it's illegal for them to say this is an actual loan which is going to give you money so how it works though in terms of how they get paid is they take money from your account every single day and the number changes and going through that process what i learned is that the number is very much negotiable so at certain times we were paying like $200 a day for certain loans if they gave us $10,000 or something like that, right? But then one of the times I was talking to them, I was like, hey, I can't, I can't pay that. Like I don't have the money to pay that. Um, and they were just kind of like, okay, well we could do like 200. And I was like, okay, so it is negotiable. But when I found out how negotiable it really was, was when we stopped paying on it. That's when I realized like, oh, you're the guy I'm talking to, whoever the broker is or whatever, is getting a lot of this money. So 
when I stopped paying on it, they were like, hey, we noticed you aren't making any payments. And it was $200 before, but we could do $75 a day. I'm like, you could do $75 a day. You guys were not doing that before. Like, y'all were not trying to give me no lower rates like that. Before, it was like, oh, my God, that's too low. We try to do it based off your risk level. We really want to make sure that you pay. I'm just like, okay. Okay. But I found out they go a lot lower. So, shout out to my guy, Tori. He put me onto this. Right. So once we start paying the loans, they have something called a UCC lien. And that's pretty much a blanket lien, which you can put pretty much on anything. And what they have you do is you have to sign. I, I'm going to butcher this. I'm going to call it an affidavit memorandum. Maybe that's I don't know. I, maybe I made that up. I don't know. But it's they have to sign a paper that pretty much says that you will forfeit whatever assets you have to pay the debt if you don't pay or if you default on the loan, right? So you're pretty much giving them permission to go after your stuff beforehand, before they even give you the money. So he was telling me that I should take a lien out on the house itself, like a personal lien, right? Because if they look at the house, if they find it, they're not going to want to have to put a lien on it because they're going to be the third or fourth person on the house and they're not going to get their money because the first person is the mortgage. They are the first person to get paid when the house gets sold. So what we ended up doing was we had Melissa come up with like a, she made a lien or a loan that she lent to the Bamboo Project for like $150,000, right? On paper, that's what it says. So if you go and look at the title of the company it'll say that's how much money that she loaned us so he was saying that once they see that they're like ah man do we really want to get involved with that nah let's go after something else which they end up trying to do they end up going after our Turo money on a wrong account they end up going after our paypal account with no money in it there's a lot of those different things they'd like to try to go after but we didn't have any money and we definitely didn't have any money in those accounts for sure. So we were. So this was my thing, right? It was kind of. It sucks so much that we're not going to get any money from the house. I was not sure whether or not it would work, and if there were liens on the house, I did not want to pay to find out whether or not it worked or not because it's a couple hundred dollars to figure that out to run title myself. I didn't want to do that, but I figured whenever the house gets sold, we would know by then whether or not there are liens on the house. So when they pull title. They said there are no liens on the house other than the one that Melissa has on the house. And I have to pay 200 something dollars, I think, to have it released. So that means that if we had successfully flipped the house in the time period that we said we we're going to flip it in, then we would have been able to keep all the money without actually having the pay off the MCA loans with the sale of the house. But as y'all know, we did not sell the house when we wanted to sell it. It's way after it's been broken into a fourth time, as y'all saw last week. Um, so, you know, we're, we were not taking a, 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 a win on the house regardless because of all the interest we paid. If we were to do the math on that interest, we're talking about $1,600 uh, times 12 equals, say, 9200 Let's do that times two. So we already paid about 40 grand on the house in just interest, right? Roughly. Uh, then you have to pay extension loans or extension fees for pushing back the sale of the house. So that's just that. Then we spent about 80 something thousand. Honestly, it's probably more like it's so weird. Okay, <sighs> bro. So we had borrowed 85,000 from family and friends to fix the house so right there we're at let's say 100 130 right then the mca lenders so we had gotten maybe about thirty thousand from them so now we're at what's that a hundred and we were at 85 plus 430 so we're at 170 thousand right so at 170 thousand then you have the cost of the house so the cost was 116,000. So we're at 286, right? And then you have 
the initial renovation loan, which was 75000 So we were all in. And this is not including like minimal expense. Like I don't I don't even think about gas. I don't even think about food on the way out there. I don't even think about eat it like this knickknack things here and there. We got to buy a doorknob like a lot of those things aren't included on here. But just to pro it, I would I would even tolls because I know we have a lot of tolls going out there and the car insurance and so many things. But I would say maybe an additional five thousand dollars. We're talking about three sixty five. Right. So plus another five thousand on that. We're at three sixty six. So all in all, we're probably we probably spent about three hundred and sixty six thousand dollars on the house. The house is currently selling for. It's selling for two fifteen, two ten, but with all the credits, we're probably only it, it's we're only getting back maybe one eighty, right? So, and that's that's a rough estimate. And by that one eighty, we get it back. We have to pay one sixty seven or probably a little bit more to the lenders. So there's not really much money left in the house at all, right? So, like I said, there was that at that point there was no way that we were coming out of it, but we could have we could have managed it if we didn't have the MCA loans. It might have been more than thirty. I'm, I might have been more than thirty. I'm not sure. Um, and we sold it when we wanted to sell it. Like all of those things, really, just like having to pay so much more in interest for waiting an extra year cost about another thirty thousand or twenty thousand dollars. So it was just it was it was just crazy. Um, and even things like security for the house and insurance on the house, it, it's a lot. Um, so with those numbers, it's like I said, I don't I was not expecting to be profitable with the house. I thought we might get money back, and to me, getting money back is not the same as profitable but we still have more money in our account than we had before and we could have used that money to do something else with so at this point we probably don't even get back the money that we put into the house which is the super loss um so like i said we're gonna hopefully close next week and i talked to my agent and he was able to get the buyer to pay for the security doors on the house so that's something else that does not come out of our pocket but it probably comes out as a credit on the house but the dog doors are on the house right now and it should be secure there should not be any issues of break-ins to the house for the next week because honestly it's literally going to be on there for just a week um so they have the front door that should be secured. The back door should be secured. I believe the windows on the side should also be secured. Uh, but they stole all the appliances, bro. They stole all the appliances. That's crazy. It hurts. It hurts. It feels like you got robbed. Like, like it feels crazy. And I couldn't even imagine. Because I've heard people talk about this before where if someone breaks into your house you feel like you've been mm, i don't know what the word is people have said things like taken advantage of they feel like they've been i don't want to say sodomized but maybe that's what it is they they say just they just feel like they've been like they just feel like gross and i kind of understand that and i didn't even live in the house i couldn't imagine living in a house that someone broke into because I feel like you can never really feel comfortable again. Because you feel like, especially if you run into the person. Because you have this thought of where I live right now, someone is going to break in again. Like, there's always a possibility of someone breaking in. At least if it never happened, you could kind of have you could kind of have that thought of, oh, I have security cameras. I have, you know, a, a far, long driveway. I have all these lights. Nobody's going to get in here. But I feel like once it happens, it's like, wow. Like, it's a... Uh, it's an emotional, I think it's a, it's a traumatic experience because I know how much we put into the house in terms of energy, effort, time, getting, uh, oh my God, we, I don't even know if the vlog ever even went out of us having to get that refrigerator in there 
Oh my God. Like, and just thinking about it is like, we went through so much just to get those appliances in the house and someone came and stole all of them and they stole the water heater and they stole the sink, which I got from my aunt, which we had to drive out to her house to get it and deliver it and then drive. I think we did the same day. I think we drove all the way up to Westchester, which is about an hour drive from here. And then we drove uh, two hours to get to Philadelphia to drop the sink off. And somebody stole it and ripped it out the wall. That is so crazy. And it's like, we weren't going to keep the house anyway. So I feel like on a sentimental level, it's odd that I care like that. Because we were going to sell to somebody else. But I just feel like it's something that we created and we're like, we really want to hand it off the way that we made it. So somebody can see the work and effort and energy that went into it. But, you know, we live and we, we, live and we learn. Um, people have always asked me, will I do it again? And like I said, it's like, not in that way, for sure. Um, and obviously the candles are doing so well. I don't even see, it doesn't really make sense for me to try to do that again because the only reason we were going to buy the house and flip it was so that we can be in the position that we are in right now, which is we have found a way to make money and it's money that we can create. So the house was like a stepping stone to get there. I, oh, I did want to have a house. I wanted to keep it myself, but it was always a stepping stone because we were going to refinance out, get the money and reinvest into something else. That was always the plan. We never knew it was going to be candles. We had no idea what it would be, but we that was always the goal. We're here where we want to be, but the path to here was a little, not a little bit, was very, very rocky. So would I flip another house? I don't can't see why I would. Because even think about people like Pace Morby, right? He's a, a, a YouTube creator investor guru type of guy right and it's like when you're buying and flipping houses you can really i feel like there's a cap on it like no one i don't feel like anybody is flipping hundreds of thousands of houses right you the bigger you get it's not the more you flip, it's the bigger the house you flip or a place you flip is. So for me, that that I never really liked the idea of having a ceiling on what I'm trying to do. So as far as the candles go, there's not really a ceiling. Because let's say that everybody in the let's say that we succeeded and everybody in the world has a candle, right? Let's say that's the thing that happens. The candle will run out and then you'll get another candle. So the, the business doesn't stop from that perspective. And then we also grow in terms of what we sell besides candles, what we sell in terms of if it's a spray, if it's a diffuser, if it's uh, and it's like it just it changes. So. I always like to have something that I know has full, like a very large potential. And we also want to do things outside of candles in the sense of maybe create our own market and do things that aren't just specifically just selling candles. So it's, it's much larger. With real estate, it's just buy a bigger place, hold it, and get the income from it every single month. Like that's, that's really what it is. And if I think about it, the, the, the richest people like who have the highest net worth it's not real estate like it's really not real estate it's it's investing which is the similar or same thing as owning a business so you know i just think that it just kind of worked itself out in that way so to answer the question of would I do it again i would only buy a building for to store the money that we get so I would buy something like this that we live in that's several uh, hundred units. Um, I would work with Tory so we could build like a city. I would do new development, um, but single family flips, 
I wouldn't do that. And the house is boarded up. That's crazy. Yeah, I would because it's it's just too small and it's not something I would want to deal with. So I would probably only do new developments and commercial. That's probably the only thing I see myself doing down the line. So no more single family flips, double family flips, multi little family. I'm I don't the the cheese is not big enough for me. I feel like and the things like what I what we get from it is just not that great. Like it's we're in a different position than we were in before. So anybody that wants to buy a house and flip it, I understand. But or even rent it out, I I understand it a hundred percent. But if we do twelve hundred dollars in a day at a craft fair, right? And you have a single family house that you charge. Let's say, let's just say you have a really nice unit that you charge three thousand dollars a month for in rent, right? And you're keeping, let's say you're keeping twenty five hundred, which is absurd to even keep from the rent because you have to pay a mortgage, right? That's twenty five hundred dollars that you get every month. We can make that now in two days. So. Or three days so it's it's crazy to be like okay I want to keep buying these houses that have all of this serious upkeep I have to deal with people on multiple levels in the sense of I have a tenant I have a contract I have a property manager who all have to get paid for the house because the bigger you get huh I'm interested the bigger you get do your margins get lower because you have to now hire everybody to manage everything I guess is it similar to candles in that way maybe it might be similar but yeah that that's my take i wouldn't do it if you and if you want to 200 dollars a month is not a 400 a month is not a lot in terms of a rental property and from what you have to go through to get it so you know that is my take on that uh next topic y'all yeah, know that we are doing chelsea um Today is the third day of the week we're doing Chelsea. Monday, obviously the first day, Tuesday, second day. If you're in the Discord, then you will see how it has been going so far. Uh, we had a spectacular day on Monday. Uh, and the three days from Saturday, Sunday to Monday, we made like $2,600 uh, selling candles. We were double booked on Sunday and things went crazy on, on Monday. So... Here's a little rundown of how Monday was going. We were honestly shocked for how much money we made that day because it was nasty weather outside. It was rainy. It was snowing. It was windy. But people still showed out to come and buy candles. And shout out to Rita. So this was this was crazy. She actually had DM'd us a week ago or so, and she was asking if we're going to be at Chelsea. And we were like, ah, oh, you know, not this week, but, you know, we're, we're definitely funny enough. It's funny that she asked because we had just, shout out to Bill, we had just gotten, like, just booked Chelsea and Terry. Can't forget about Terry. Shout out to Bill and Terry. Uh, we just got the booking for that week. So when she had DM'd us, we were like, yep, absolutely. We'll be there, not this week, but next week. She said, okay, I'm going to come up. I'm going to pull up. So we're like, cool. So she comes on Monday, which is the day one of the fair. And Melissa was was working and selling, was, I guess, working the table, I would say. Um, I went to probably get something to eat. So I am sitting down eating, right? And I'm checking out numbers for the day. And I see a huge spike. Like a huge jump from where we were at to where we were at now. And I'm like, what the heck just happened? I'm like, this is a, such a large jump from one order. I got to go see what happened. So I go back to the table. And Melissa tells me that someone just bought six big candles at one time. And I'm like, six big, mind you, each candle was $40. So they bought six candles at one time. And I'm like, what? She was like, yeah, while I was selling, she was just waiting there for me, just hanging out. I was, you know, playing the game with somebody, talking to a customer. And when they left, she's like, yeah, I was here. She gave her story to Melissa. 
Um, and she explained that she had a candle before and she wanted to get six more big ones. And I'm just like, Melissa's telling me this story. I'm like, this is crazy. So that first day with her, with her, with her purchase, which is about things like 260, we were at 800 and I want to say $40 for the day. Oh my goodness. It was like the first day of Chelsea, the first time we did it last month. We made, I'm gonna give you an exact number how much we made that first week. That first day, we made $307. That's it. $307 the first day of Chelsea last week, last month. This month, we did $860 the first day of Chelsea. And, and it was raining and it was snowing. It was cold outside. And we still did 860. And if without without her sale, which is an anomaly, of course, we were still roughly at about six and some change. We would have been at six hundred and twenty dollars for the day, which is really good. We would have had twenty nine sales and six hundred twenty dollars. Honestly, I think we would have sold another big candle. Not, I mean, I say that. I'm not gonna say that. We didn't sell another one. That's what we were at. We were at six twenty. Six. That's not bad. And we still think it was pretty slow for what we know Chelsea can be. So we're just working our way up. We're learning what we need to have. We have a different setup. Um, I think that we have the setup, I want to say different, but it's different than the one we had before. So when we were there. So I think that that helps. Uh, we're still by the door, which is, you know, not terrible. We didn't have any chairs. So maybe that also helped. We were standing up the whole time. So I'm excited for this week. I think today is, is a lot better in terms of uh, the weather. So it might be crazy. And it's Wednesday. So they here's the crazy part. Okay, I didn't even think about this. I forgot about this completely. Okay, so. Monday was raining. It was snowing. It was cold. And it was windy. Tuesday was worse than Monday. We made 860 on Monday. On Tuesday it was a very slow day. Tuesday we made 420, right? Those two days are the slowest days at the market. In terms of foot traffic for anybody that goes to that market or sells at that market, those two are the lowest foot traffic days at the market. So if we're going by that, that would mean if I was to speculate speculative guesses that we should do more the the day is coming up so we just have to make sure that we have enough inventory to manage it if it gets crazy over the next couple of days so like i said and today is a lot nicer outside so i'm very excited to see what happens uh for the rest of this week tuesday day number two all right this day was slow like we were struggling to get through the day with no chairs, no, no, uh, no foot traffic. And this, the, the wind and snow was so much crazier than it was on Monday. Like I'm talking about, it was, people would open the door and vendors things would just fly off their table. One person's, uh, I don't know if she had something that broke here, a glass on the table that flew off and broke. We were standing by the door and the sign flew off, paper flew from under the table, bags were flying everywhere. Like it was that kind of windy. Uh, I had went to, was it Dunkin' Donuts? Where was I? Where was it? Dunkin' Donuts? It was Dunkin' Donuts when I left. I had like opened the door to leave. The door swung open and hit the side of the building. And I'm just like, dead. Yeah, like it's, it was crazy kind of windy that day. And the snow was crazy. Like it was just wild weather. So one thing I noticed about the habits of the people that come out in that kind of weather is that they are tourists. Because if you are going on vacation somewhere, you are not staying in the house because of the weather. You know why? Because you already checked what the weather was before you got there. So you already brought the proper clothing to go outside. You brought your jacket, you brought your gloves, you brought your scarves, you brought your rain boots. You have all the things because you already knew it was either going to snow or rain when you got there. So Tuesday was mostly tourists because if you live in that city, you're like, man, I am not. Hey, look, look outside. I'm not going outside. Ain't nothing out there for me to go out there right now. I'm staying my. I'm staying right here in the house. I'm not going nowhere. So, 
it was a lot of tourists that day and it was a very like we call it the sunday vibes so it, like i said with a sunday vibe and that kind of bad weather we still did 420 which we didn't hit 400 that first week until we did 234 dollars on tuesday that of that week um friday so we didn't do 400 dollars until friday of that week which is crazy that's insane so yes that's amazing like that is phenomenal and there was no crazy orders yesterday and we did 16 sales so i'm hoping today today we're going crazy today i'm hoping i don't want to put too much sauce on it because every time we do that things get go terrible so hopefully things go well today or decently nice um so i guess as far as the Chelsea, that's it. We are, oh, well, I guess in more candle related news. Ah, man, I'm telling y'all, we're going to be making, oh my goodness. Okay. So we buy vessels. I don't even know how I told you this, Melissa. So the vessels that we have found, we had kind of saw them before, but they are, this, they look very similar to the ones we had before. And they cost eight cents. So we have to buy a thousand of them. That's a minimum. It's a thousand. So that'll be 83 cases of, of uh, vessels. So I'm trying to figure I might put it. Uh, if we, I will put it in Hadassah's house probably. Because um, we can't fit that here. But that we currently are paying like. Basically four dollars per vessel at this point. So. That dramatically decreases how much money we like that increases the profit margins for the candle significantly. So it's yeah, it's that is it's so crazy. But it, again, we have to buy a thousand. That thousand, I'm gonna have to check. Have we even sold a thousand big candles since we've been selling candles? Okay, so for big candles, we have sold bruh like 500 roughly like 400 close something that's four or five hundred something in that range right so that means that from and this is from the inception of us started selling candles we have not sold a thousand candles big candles so if we bought this thousand this we would have this we would not have to buy candles again for mad long so here i'm gonna give you a, an idea of the price difference in terms of what we pay right now if we were to buy a thousand candles from the people that we buy them from now it would cost us three thousand five hundred dollars to buy those candles the vessels themselves right three thousand five hundred dollars if we buy the same we i'm buying a sample first to make sure they're the same vessels because we think we found their suppliers if we buy those same candles from the actual supplier themselves Instead of being three thousand five hundred dollars for a thousand, it would be eight hundred dollars. Eight hundred dollars for one thousand vessels. A thousand. One thousand vessels is eight hundred dollars as opposed to three thousand five hundred dollars. Do you know how much money we're saving? Oh my God, it's so crazy. Every time I think about it, I'm like, that's crazy. So, like I said, we are trying to get the, exp like, so we're, we're making more money and we want, to now, we want to go in the opposite direction. Now, we're going to start lowering the expenses. So now that we have a bigger margin of how much money we get to keep after each craft fair and sale and whatever, we can start paying people back. We can start paying off other loans and we can start investing more into the business faster so that we can actually get more products more sense better branding and we're still in q1 we only in q i, I know it feels like a long time it's only q1 right now we haven't even hit q2 yet so you already know that by q3 by q3 we gonna be and and then this there's a q4 after that which is the holiday season oh my god we're gonna be ready for holiday season but you know i don't want to get too 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 excited but that's, you know, where we at right now. So we're still working on getting all the branding things right. So next topic, some of y'all may be familiar with this. Uh, so it is, it's called uh, Silicon Valley Bank. 
And I just think it's very interesting because we have talked about selling on Etsy. Etsy, we've talked about selling on Fair. Uh, we talked about using Pinterest ads. And a lot of these companies have their money with Silicon Valley Bank. So I'm going to give you my uh, rudimentary understanding of what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. When you put your money in the bank, they don't keep the cash sitting in the bank, right? As you may know, they invest the cash into different things. One of those things being treasury bonds, right? You buy it today. And in 10 years, it's guaranteed to give you 1.5% on your money or 2% of your money, right? But you have to wait those 10 years to get the money back. So this bank had put a lot of their money into that and into mortgage-backed securities, as we know from 2008, isn't always the best thing, right? Someone decided that they want to take a lot of their money. Honestly, from what I've heard, it's been either two people or maybe I know one big person, but it might be two big people that decide to take their money out of that bank. Right. So when they did that, the windfall that came from it was a lot of other people saw the stock going down and issues where they say, oh, my God, why is this person taking the money out of the bank? I would do the same thing. So now a lot of people go to the bank to take their money out. But as y'all know, the money is not there. And in this situation, it's a little bit worse because the money is in this bond. You have to let it mature over 10 years. If you take it out earlier than that, you're going to lose money. So now every dollar that the bank is giving back to you, they're giving it back to you at a loss. So that means that they cannot cover everybody coming in and withdrawing their money so every time they give a dollar out this is hypothetical they lose two dollars so after they get to 50 percent of paying everybody out there is still 50 percent of people who are not going to get paid because they are giving money away at a loss so the thing about this particular bank is they funded a lot of startups right a lot or invest in a lot of startups like i named earlier pinterest fair roblox uh, Etsy, BuzzFeed. So like pretty much, pretty much all the young people apps that y'all like to use are, are funded by Roblox. Yeah. Roblox. There's another one with an M. I feel like you told me that what did I saw in the thing you sent. Uh, so it's not good. All right. So already, as soon as that happened, some of these businesses that are attached to them are like unable to now give you your money. Because their money is held with them. So one of those is Etsy. People already complain that Etsy is holding their money. Same thing with FAIR. FAIR is a wholesale website. So my personal opinion on situations like this is, I know it sounds crazy. Do not trust any platform market. That has been what I've seen over the last 10, 15 years. Any, honestly, any platform you shouldn't trust because it doesn't seem like any of them really have your best interest at heart. Um, me particularly, I have my trust in Square, but I would, when we have the money, I will for sure have our own built website from the ground up. We just can't afford it. And from what I've seen, Square has seemed to be the most up and up before they even got big. Like I was, I was, listen, Square is my favorite company from when they were just like when they, I don't know if they bought Cash App or made Cash App. Cash App is a great company. They actually bought the company that I used to work for, which was Caviar. Then they sold it before they got into the craziness in terms of Caviar to DoorDash. So that was a smart decision. They got out the business, got all the emails, got all the phone numbers, all the processing fees and then they they dipped right all the credit card information and they left and i feel like even interacting with them as a company is always a positive interaction etsy people complain about etsy all the time people complain about fair 
people complain about, I don't know about Roblox very much, but a lot of these platforms, they start changing their rules and it usually negatively affects the people on the platform. I feel like for the most part, they don't change their rules to be better. I don't feel like that. It's always like we're changing rules that'll help us and not you. So like I said, I am not a fan of those apps and companies and platforms they supplement the candle business but i would be very upset if they became a main driver of it um because then we'll be shipping out candles and not getting paid and as y'all already know they were holding our money when we first started like we first started and their excuse was you're making too much sales congratulations we're holding your money like that's a crazy reasoning to, to, to give me um Maybe that's why. Maybe they didn't have the money from, honestly, maybe that's the reason. Maybe they knew from back in Silicon Valley bank days, they didn't have the money to give it out. So they have to minimize how much they give out in deposits. Or, yeah, and, and, uh, and that's what it's called? No. I don't know what they call. Withdrawals, whatever. So, you know, it is, it is what it is. But I do want to keep an eye on that because I really believe that there are going to be a lot of other platforms that people use that start acting really funny because the money's acting funny and i've seen some people say that it's connected to the whole crypto ftx thing if y'all are familiar with that so people are speculating that another larger bank that is attached to silicon valley will also have a huge falling out so just stay tuned for that stay tuned for that so this is the next topic melissa and i were having a conversation recently um about whether or not a, you can define a good man by how he treats his mom. I never really thought about it much, but I remember thinking that it didn't make sense before. I never really tried to dissect it. And they say that if he treats his mom right, he's gonna treat you right. right? That's kind of like the, the, the saying about having a guy that is go with his mom. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, a lot of the men I know that have these very positive, I don't wanna say positive, but like, that are very close with their mom, don't tend to be solid men. And I think it's funny that that's the thing that they say. So the more I thought about it, I realized that for one, why would a woman want to be treated the same way that he treats his mom? Like that shouldn't be a barometer for how well he's going to treat you because you're not his mother. So the things he does for her, you should not expect him to do for you because you're not the same person. That's number one. I think a guy that is more distant from his mom is a better quality of man for his wife. I don't think that he should not have a relationship with his mom, but I think that it should be further than closer. I think too close of a relationship with your mother is bad as a guy because I don't think that she can help being a woman around you and I, if that's your mom and she's raising you, I don't think those qualities are going to be the thing that you want to take into dating another woman. All right, so I'll let Melissa have her League of Villains segment. For today's League of Villains segment, I will be slandering Donovan. Yes. Why? Yesterday, Donovan woke up and did not talk to me. Like... Okay. Donovan has been beefing with me all day yesterday. So, like, you know how, like, you act when you have beef with somebody? Like, you, you don't really, like, have a conversation with them. You're just kind of cordial. That that has been Donovan's yes, um, all day yesterday. That. Affects me very much. But I also don't know why he's upset. Because he's just being cordial. And I explained it. So. I mean yesterday kind of rough for me. 
Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. So I ended up missing another day of journaling last week. Um, but I'm going to keep trying to journal at least four times a week because... It, like I said, that that's, I was thinking about it. The goal is not the goal. It's whatever you wrote for your goal. Does that make sense? So, like, I think a lot of the times we make the goal the goal. So it's like, oh, if I didn't hit this goal, then fuck it. So, yeah, the goal is not the goal. I just want to build a habit of journaling more. So there's that. Yesterday I was on Instagram and I got an ad for an app called Balance. It's supposed to be like some type of meditation app or something like that. Because I was, you know, very stressed out yesterday. I I thought it was funny that Instagram gave it to me as an ad. And they're doing a whole year free subscription. So I'm going to check it out for the year and see how that goes. And like I said, it's called a balance app, so it's probably free to you too if you sign up. Yesterday also sucked because we don't have any chairs. Donovan kind of mentioned it at Chelsea. So I had ordered some chairs and they came in today and they're like retractable. So I hope it works the way that I think it should. And I'm excited to use that today because my feet are killing me from being on my feet all day. I'm very tired and I think I think I'm going to have ice cream for breakfast. That is the end of the League of Villains segment. Uh, okay, so as I was sitting over there during the League of Villains segment, I went on Twitter. And on Twitter, it says that one of the banks that's attached to this whole Silicon Valley thing was Signature Bank. And now Robinhood is not allowing you to take out your withdrawals or take out the money that you earned or won whatever invested i don't know how to what to call it but let's say you shorted signature bank they're not giving you your money back on your wins for that company and this is why i was saying before like, i don't like these platforms like these like they're it's weird they're like new age platforms that i don't like they're just very like like very shady like it's i don't know why what that is they wow i know what it is I know what it is. I know what it is. Okay. So a lot of times on here, I've talked about this whole economy that we have that doesn't make money. Like they're all negative and then trying to like find a way to be positive. So they'll be negative for 10 years or five years or whatever. And they'll be like, well, I'm getting market share. So that's all that's important. I don't need to make money. And it's like, that's all fine and dandy. Until you need to have money to either pay people out or to pay something else that happens. When something negative comes up, like, uh, you know, the virus or whatever else happens, you need money to be able to cover your six months, your employees, your debt, whatever the case is. So I think that that is what we're going to start seeing. I think that's what's happening now. I think a lot of these companies are running so slim a margin because they have not been profitable or are currently not profitable that at any time that people want to go get their money from them whether it be to withdraw from an app like robin hood or fair or etsy or um what's the other ones that be doing stuff like this weird stuff uh honestly i guess ftx there's a lot of these companies like that they're not profitable they are they are just People keep loaning them money and they just keep make being less profitable. Like that's their whole idea is if I can uh, live long enough, then I will be able like if, I, if my company can survive long enough, I don't have to ever make money. That's how they look at it, which is like it is a way to run a business for sure. It is. It's, that's how the whole government is run anyways. But the problem is these companies are not the government, so they cannot print the money they cannot create the money so they if the government needs money they just make more they go okay damn people need money they just print some more if uber needs money who that's it you're not you're not printing money there's no way for you to print the money that's it and i think that that is it starts from the top the companies think that they can run their business the way the companies or the government is being run and it don't work like that that's not how it works and i think that a lot of people are forgetting that like how many times does robin have to mess up before people stop 
going and putting the money in there. Well, you can find all the behind the scenes content on our social medias. Mine is Donovan Gray, D-O-N-I-V-A-N-G-R-A-Y. And you have my phenomenal, beautiful, amazing girlfriend, Anita Byrne, A-N-E-T-A-B-U-R-N. You know what it is, hashtag Bamboo Project 2023. The road to 500K is in full effect. Now with that being said, Bamboo Project out.